let me introduce to you some three awesome people that I work with on a weekly basis. Um, we're all members of the Behavioral Intervention Team, BIT, dealing with a lot of student issues. And coming up next for our panel, we have Mr. Al Story, who is with the Office of Threat Assessment. We have Greg Vanderwall, who's with the Counseling Center, and Jeremy Henderson, who's with the Office of Student Care and Wellbeing. So here's our plan for this next session. I'll just sort of say it so that the guys know. They have provided, they've each provided PowerPoints that are in your binders. They are not going to be following these PowerPoints exactly, but sort of giving you the overall message. But you have the resources there for them. And if Elizabeth or somebody needs to come up and put up a PowerPoint or check with the guys and see what they want, that would be great because I don't know how to use, I'm a Mac user, I don't know what this, this thing here, I don't know how to use it. Um, but what we'd like to do for this particular session, because I think the information is so valuable and you all have questions on what to do about this or this, We'll have them each talk about their unit and what they do overall. There's some information in your binders about that. And then we'd like to open the floor to questions from you. What do we do if, I, you know, what do I do if I have a student who does this? Or what should we be looking for with that? Or how does your office handle a threat? You know, what are the sorts of things you see? Here's a great opportunity to ask questions of these folks to find out what's going on and what you as a GTA might want to know. And so with that, we are, we can start. Did uh, one of you want to start with a PowerPoint or you just want to talk sort of broadly about um, what you do? So the students have the PowerPoints in their binders, everything, all that information with uh, the cover sheet I shared with you with the uh, information for each of you. Um, and if you like, you can talk about each of your units and then we can open the floor to questions. Does that sound good? All right. I'll let you guys take it over, and if there's anything you need me to do, just give me a shout. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pagani. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be here this morning. Um, you guys, uh, y'all want to just open it up with questions, or you want us to go through our PowerPoints, and that might generate some questions? What, uh, what would work best? I can't talk. Quick, who you are and what you the, uh, yeah. So my name is Al Story, and I'm the director of credit assessment here at the University of Alabama. So uh, going back to uh, what Lieutenant Arnold was speaking about with Run, High Five, uh, our mission, our goal at the University of Alabama Office of Credit Assessment is to get ahead of that. Um, the, the last case scenario, we want to be proactive. We want to identify excuse me, certain behaviors uh, that we look for uh, to be proactive to get ahead of the situation so ultimately we can prevent uh, and, and not have to deal with any kind of active shooter or assailant here on campus. Um, the main goal that we try to do is, is identify the inappropriate behavior early. We try to get, uh, get ahead of it to be proactive. Uh, but we can't do that uh, without uh, you, know, you guys letting us know. Um, you know Y'all are the eyes and ears of, of the campus. Everybody, everyone knows what normal behavior is uh, among our peer groups, among our uh, co-workers. And so that's what we ask, is, is when you see someone, you know, having a, a bad day or, or you know, well, we all have bad days, but exhibiting consistently inappropriate behavior that's concerning. Th those are the type of situations that we want to know about. Um, and I think I include all the, uh, well, all of them, I, I include a lot of indicators of inappropriate behavior in this uh, slide presentation. You know, uh, we, we get calls all the time, and sometimes it's just a matter of, uh, of us you know, sitting down and talking with, uh, with a certain individual and, and being able to talk it out. And uh, you know, as human beings, we all deal with, with stress and anxiety in, in different ways. And uh, you know, quite frankly, sometimes individuals just need a little bit of assistance to get over a, a, a hard patch in their life. Uh, before it becomes a, a complete right, a breakdown where you know, it becomes something about. So I have a question for Al as we talk about this because we're on the university campus and as we talk about unusual behaviors, you know, we see a lot of things within the realm of academia that may, you know, somewhere else not be seen as a lot, but here we see other people with you know, expression of certain things. So, Al, can you tell our GTAs? What are some of those concerning behaviors? How consistent do they have to be? What does push it over the top or does become a concern 
as opposed to uh, uh, a head of freedom, BOC in your mind, or is it, you know, what might a uh, GTA C be great, for example, that might be disturbing behavior should you avoid it? Right, that, that's a great question. When, you, uh, you know, when you're looking at different uh, work products that students are turning in, uh, you, you look for you know, the, the specifically violent uh, suggestions, you know, whether it can be, obviously, it can be writings, it can be drawings, it can be pretty much any way uh, that they're conveying a, uh, an extraordinary amount of violence or anger. Uh, you know, what we've seen uh, in the past with a lot of uh, you know, situations like this, um, you know, individuals, uh, they perceive that they've been bullied. Um, a lot of times they have agreements. Uh, individuals that you're concerned about, if you've had some type of interaction with them and you feel like um, they can push, and, and a lot of times, um, you know, they'll let you know. They're, they're, they're ready to come to they lay down. Uh, and looking at a lot of the previous active shooters, you know, what do you hear? Um, you know, you go back and you do an after action investigation that feels that, well, you know, I knew this, I saw this behavior, um, but the right hand didn't let the left hand know what was going on. And, uh, and that's what we're looking for. We're looking for um, extraordinary uh, examples of anger, aggression, or uh, suggested violent behavior. So then let's, let's bring this question to Greg. Uh, Greg Van Wolf with the Counseling Center. So when we talk about concerning behaviors that went on your way off, for example, what are the sorts of things that the GTA should be looking for or sensitive to with their students? Sure. Well, um, let me uh, start by just introducing our department a little bit, and then I'll answer your question as we talk about that. So I am uh, Dr. Greg Vanderwall. I'm a clinical psychologist, and I'm the director of the counseling center here. And if nothing else, I want you to walk away knowing that we are a resource for you, for you as a student, um, in your work here, but also for you as an instructor, as a GTA, um, in the work you're doing with other students here. Uh, we offer a lot of services to you. Uh, we offer counseling, individual counseling, group counseling that's available to you as a student. We also, and this is especially uh, true for your uh, GTA role, we offer consultation. If you ever have a question or a concern about a student, about yourself, you can give us a call. Uh, and you can talk to one of our licensed mental health professionals and we'd be happy to give you some advice, give you some steps to take, um, talk about how we can help you and help your student. In your binder, we have um, a Help and Distress Students brochure. This is a really good resource. It gives you good um, information about signals and signs to watch out for that might indicate a student is in distress, uh, and also some suggestions as to how you can approach interacting with that student and helping them get connected to the resources they need. If nothing else, you can act in your role uh, effectively when you know what to look for. You recognize and feel comfortable that it's okay to talk to people that you might be concerned about and ask some questions and, and indicate that you have some concern. And then if they do need some help, to be able to feel confident about how to connect them to that help, how to make a good referral and how to follow up with them. You will encounter some students who are in distress, and they may be able to resolve that just by talking to them. Uh, they might be upset about the break, and you can find a way forward. You may interact with students who are in distress and may need some resources, and it's good to know what those are and how you can connect them. And you may also run into students who are experiencing a crisis that needs some immediate action, whether that's a life or death concern, whether they experience a significant hardship recently, like uh, a loss or um, significant change in their um, living status or potentially a sexual assault. And it's good to know how to get connected to um, uh, crisis resources. So I'll emphasize, if you ever encounter a student who is struggling with, for example, thoughts on other people, thoughts of suicide, call somebody, call you AD, that same number that they have to program in the, um, the active shooter presentation for, you can call them and say, I've got a concern about a student that's and they can help you. They can connect you with us at the counseling center and we can take immediate action to help that student. I want you to know that that's available to you not only during your typical business hours, but also after hours. Um, from 5 p.m. on, we have an on-call counselor who's available for crisis situations. So if you have a concern, for example, the student emails you at 11.30 at night and there's some concerning information that you know, and you're concerned about, then you can reach out to the on-call counselor and get some advice. 
So some things to watch out for. A lot of that is if you're not sure whether it's anxiety, depression, change in mood or behavior. Um, ultimately, if you notice a significant change in how a student is functioning, they're not coming to class anymore, uh, they're not turning in their assignments on time, or their behavior differently, that might be an indication that a student could be in distress. And that's a really good opportunity to reach out to them and to ask them how they're doing. Um, most students who are struggling very much appreciate if somebody notices and shows that it shows enough that they care to reach out and ask. So that's a really good step. Thank you, Pat. So, Jeremy, you were the office of student care and well-being. Can you talk a little bit? And he's also the uh, what uh, the head, the chair of the behavioral intervention team. So we heard the cats every week with the, the case situation that we look at. So I'm wondering, Jeremy, if you talk a little bit about what your office does and what your office can do to help the GTAs with the situation they might see. How does that sort of blend together? And can you talk a little bit about your role in it and what it does? I'm going to ask you something to do about it. I'm just going to talk more about it. Sure. Well, um, well, it's good to see all of you like Jeremy and your sense of student care well-being. Uh, student care well-being, I think you have some information in your binders about us. You know, we help students that are going through just a wide variety of difficult situations. So as you're working with students, you know, certainly these, uh, these areas of concern, um, you know, mental health concerns, some of the things that we've been talking about already, but also you're just a student that may uh, not know a resource on campus. You know, we can, they can come to us and we can help uh, develop a plan, identify resources both on campus as well as in the community. You know, we help students who may be experiencing a financial crisis. We have a, a limited amount of financial assistance that a student can apply for, and this goes for, for you all as well. It, it cannot be used for anything on the student account, so I need to say that kind of loud and clear. Unfortunately, we can't pay for tuition or on campus housing. It's really designed for kind of a short term, you know, kind of a below a thousand dollar type crisis you know, to help get over the hump and then get back, you know, get back on track with, uh, with the semester. Um, we have some assistance for food insecurity. We have a small food pantry where we can help students. We also have a program where if a student is not getting enough food to eat, we can get some meals on their action card to go into the campus dining facilities where they accept meal plans to you just walk in like any other student and swipe a meal. Um, again, this is for you all as well as for students that you may encounter that you can send our way. Um, so again, we're really just there to help students with a, just a wide variety of bumps in the road, difficult issues, you know, that a student may face during their time here at the University of Alabama. Uh, kind of tying it back to some of the things that we've been discussing already, you know, again, just if you see a student and there's concerning behavior or something that pops up in a written assignment, you see something in an email on social media about one of your students, you know, one of the roles that our office plays, we're sort of the, uh, the repository, you know, for information to, to collect about a student. You know, uh, one of the points that Al gave you guys is probably these are some things to look out for, you know, might be a fascination with weapons. Well, you know, you might have one written assignment that is submitted that has a violent story in it. You know, and you're asking yourself the question, well, this is violent, there's weapons being used, but is it a big deal, is it an emergency, is it a fascination with, with firearms? Um, you know, you can still forward that to our office. You know, we would share it with threat assessment. Um, we may, we may not see another report from that student for their entire career at the University of Alabama, but as we get reports from multiple sources, we have them in the same database, we can put them together, and we can determine if there are any patterns of behavior. So if you're not really sure if you need a report, you can always call us, you can contact us, you can still just send that report to us. Um, again, it doesn't hurt to overshare information. Our website is bamacares.ua.edu, which I think is also in your information, your binder, and so to you, uh, there's a student of concern reporting form that you can get to on the front page of that website. There's also buttons to apply for the financial assistance for the food industry. But again, just any type of information that you'd like to share. If you're not really sure if it's something that needs to be reported, you can contact us and we can, we can help you out with that as well. Um, as Kathy mentioned, you know, part of my role also, I have the chair of the behavioral intervention team. Um, quick show of hands, who is generally familiar with what a behavioral intervention team does, like you, maybe they were at your undergraduate institutions. Two of us, that's okay. That's great. Um, so basically, um, you know, this is relatively, it's a relatively new thing in higher education. You know, meaning, um, you go back about a little over 10 years ago, offices like mine with full-time uh, case managers, full-time staff that are building these reports, meeting together in multidisciplinary teams. You didn't see this a lot until maybe the last 10 years or so. And now almost all campuses are doing this on some level. 
where we get a group of us that are from uh, just different offices, different entities on campus. You know, so myself, uh, Dr. Vanderwall, representing the Counseling Center, um, Al Story with Threat Assessment, University of Police. We have representation from Human Resources, Title IX, Office of Legal Counsel, right? So we get this multidisciplinary team so that we get reports of concern about a student. You know, the goal is to be able to identify what concerns there might be and then intervene early, you know, before a crisis escalates or if there is a crisis in motion, you know, develop a plan with all the appropriate people at the table so that we can intervene with that student, you know, and help um, protect that student as well as protect the university community by just intervening in whatever way we can with the resources that we have available to us. And, and just like Al said, you know, largely, you know, the work that we do, we are effective by the reports that we get. You know, so again, if you are concerned, if you're worried, if it's a, a pattern of substance abuse, you know, maybe you are a GTA and you teach a class at 8 o'clock in the morning and you've got the same student that's coming in and you're smelling alcohol on their breath consistently. You know, I mean, again, uh, alcohol use uh, is, is something that a number of college students, you know, might deal with, but again, if you're seeing a pattern of a problematic alcohol abuse, but hey, who can I share this with? Again, you can pass that on to student care and well-being. Um, if it's a concern about you know, risk of harm to self or others, if it's a concern about mental health, you know, just a disruption of class, those types of things, anything that you're concerned about, you can report that to us. And again, as we see uh, patterns of behavior or a certain level of concern, we might bring that to the table at the behavioral intervention team level you know, to talk about it, you know, work with that student, or it might be something that our office handles by having a case manager follow up with the student to see if we can connect them to resources that might be helpful. So let me ask you guys this question, and this is something that you may encounter help you out while you're teaching here, but it's not for students. You know, we have options, we've heard about student uh, code of conduct, right? And then I was speaking earlier today, you know, this is the reaction the students are acting in the class. But when, how can a GT, how can we stop? How do I even know that this is not for students to be reported to you because there's a potential issue with that student? Yeah, I'll jump in again. This is something I think that is helpful for you all to know. And you can, in terms of how you might interact with a disruptive student, I think Greg's brochure about dealing with distressed students as far as just remaining calm, you know, again, just you know, not escalating the situation. But if a student is disrupting the regular course of work, whatever you're doing in the classroom setting, or if you're running a lab, if there is behavior that is getting in the way of what you're doing or the learning of other students, it is perfectly appropriate, and I would say you should, you know, directly but respectfully ask that student to stop whatever that behavior is. You know, you are, you know, you're raising your voice. Please lower your voice and stop yelling so we can continue in class. You know, please sit down and stop pacing so that we can focus on the class. I think if you make that direct request of the student to stop whatever the behavior is that is disruptive, you know, and then. Right, most of the time, a student is going to do that, they're going to stop, they're going to go on the class. If a student does not comply with your request, then technically that is a violation of the code of student conduct. And again, we're not necessarily trying to catch students and get all kinds of good students in trouble, but a lot of times that helps us when we're trying to intervene. Um, if a request is made and the student doesn't comply, by having the code of conduct violation in place, it can give us just some more tools to use to try to get that student help. Again, we're not trying to just get everybody in trouble, but it gives us some tools to get that student help because there is a code of conduct violation that is on file. If it is that code violation, the student is disruptive, they don't comply. If it's shared with the Office of Student Conduct, they will get that on to us as well. You know, if there's not a, if there's not a student conduct violation and it's maybe the student was disruptive, you ask them to stop and they stop, but it still doesn't sit really well with you're kind of concerned about how they're doing, you know, that might be something you want to share with our office and talk about the best strategy for maybe talking with that student or referring them to assist, personal assistance. Ultimately, I would say consult if you're unsure. Uh, call one of these offices and ask the question because they can help you get connected to the right place so they can say, you know what, I think you did what you need to do with this coming up again, give me a call. I think one of the important things to keep in mind is that situations often will be nuanced and that it's going to be higher. So it requires you to really keep your eyes on the listening and um, using resources available to you. And what I'd like to say to all of you is we're going to give you time to ask questions of the team. Um, but before we move on to that, one thing I would like to ask you, because you know, we're in the classroom and we're dealing with situations, we may see the sense of, I thought gender was really interesting to talk about things like um, food anxiety issues, because oftentimes we think of the sex students, we think about it, 
suicide ideation or a threat. But there are other kinds of things where we'll see some issues with our students. What is the one takeaway for this group? You see something, you're worried about something, do we go to the internet, do website, and do a report, and then it gets disseminated to the right areas? What should we do? What do we, as a student in classroom, have to make a judgment call on who to contact? Mark, I think like Greg said, you know, the number one thing you can walk away from is you really can't go wrong. You know, like, like Kathy said, sometimes there are very nuanced <laughs> situations where maybe it needs to involve counseling, maybe it needs to involve threat assessment, maybe it needs to involve our office. If you hit any one of us, we can talk with you about it and get the information to the right place. You don't have to have anxiety about that and not making the right call and not getting the right. You know, we can help steer you to the right thing. You know, yeah, I would say the, probably the number one kind of critical issue is not so much who do I call, it's more of reporting and, and that dividing line between is this an emergency or not. You know, I think not often, but at times through the course of a year, you know, I might get a report you know, from a faculty member where you know, three days ago, a student is, hard, is talking about harming themselves. They say, I don't know if I can go on. I think I might need to you know, be hospitalized. Then the report doesn't come until about three days later. Right? If they're talking about harming themselves or harming others, that's something that needs to be talked about immediately. You know, so I think that's the key thing is, is this an emergency or is it not? And then from then, you know, again, we can help get into the right information if you just reach out to any one of us, I would say. I would just reiterate that, that if it is an emergency, if it is a crisis, and that's, again, something that feels like you're going to avoid <laughs> using forms or sending emails, pick up the phone call, call you immediately, uh, call the counseling center immediately, um, call the student and well reach out to an extra human being on the phone, uh, because that's so I have one comment, but I have one quick question, and then I'll put the floor to you. So the, the comment I want to make is that you've been listening to these people talk about what they do with their sense of connectivity here. We put this panel together in a very deliberate way. You know, we can go back and we can talk about things like Christian Tech and what happened there and problems there. It's all on one go, all the go, and we get what I'm talking about. But one of the problems was that they were editing some campus not communicating very well. And I hope that one of the things that you're getting from this uh, panel, and can you still hear me okay? I'm going to lose some voice, okay. Um, one of the things I really want you to take away from here is how we've got this great connectivity on this campus. We're the model for how we handle things here. So I want you to feel very secure in that. And if you're calling Jeremy about something, or get something through his office, there's great communication going on, constant communication going on with this. And this is what you see here in a very small way with this panel. So the other thing I want to just, this is a question for Greg. You know, as an instructor running in the classroom, you know, I see some things, and there may be a student who sees the stress, needs to get to your office. So it's kind of a two-part question. Number one, if a student says, yes, instructor, will you take me to the counseling center, or will you make a phone call on my behalf? <coughs> is that okay? You know, what? So you may refer a student to us, and we may not be able to communicate 
back and say, yeah, they came, and yeah, we're working with them, because we're trying to respect that student confidentiality. But you can ask them. You can ask and say, hey, we're going to get connected. And that's a really good way of following them. If there is a need for communication between our student and you, you can communicate that to the student. They can sign a release with us, and we can do that. We can communicate, but it has to be with written consent from that student once they're involved. So I hope that answers. Uh, thank you so much. I've had a situation like that happen with me, but also uh, in my previous role, I was a uh, conflict, conflict resolutions official for arts and sciences that did a lot of things. And so that's why I direct that question to you because this does come up. All right, we've got five minutes. So do we have some questions out here? No questions from me, too small, whatever. Here we go. Regarding behavioral intervention, is missing a lot of class of behavior about which we should be concerned? Yeah, that's a good question, um, and you will see a lot of it. I would predict all of you will have some that are having this a lot of class. So um, I think you know, the first thing might be just try to, you know, maybe reach out to that student yourself and you know, see if um, you know see if you can get in contact with them. Again, to be honest, we typically can't. Uh, there's not. There's often not a whole lot we can do. You know, a lot of times, if you reach out and send an email, they don't respond to you. You know, we might do the same. They don't respond to us either. Um, so. It, it, it's a, it can be a sign of concern, but sometimes it's not, and a lot of times we're just not able to facilitate communication. If you're concerned about that student regarding this in class, I would say you can try to check in with them yourself. If you don't get a response, um, every now and then you'll get a response when the instructor does not, but, but typically they, they don't respond to us either in those situations. But you can certainly hold it. And let me just add here, there's a whole salty dog faculty member. Um, do you take attendance? You know, how do we solve this? Because you do want to get the documents and say that this is a larger picture thing, but just that's a really good question about that and why and then during the week for that answer. But do take a tendency, that's what you were solving in class. Be sure you do that. Don't let it slide. It has to do with stuff happens. And this is just some advice from me to you. I've been in a lot of different situations over the years. All right, another question. Yeah, that's a great question. Again, the, the social media aspect, 
is we get quite a few reports you know, based on what you see on social media. Um, if it involves any sort of threatening communication, you're talking about harming self, thoughts of self-harm, or harming others, that would absolutely be something we would encourage you to report. Uh, you know, if they are uh, threatening someone else, and that's a violation of the Code of Student Conduct, as long as they have a relationship with the University of Alabama, they could be the other side of the world, but it would still be a code of conduct violation, there would be an issue there. And certainly if it's, if it's um, communication about self-harm, we'd want to intervene very quickly with that student. Um, if you're able to uh, do, get an image of, if someone can get a picture of that and bring it to us, whether it's from the conduct perspective or from my office, I'm really quick that we're about out of time. But, you know, we have, with our office, when we reach out to a student that might be ill, you know, most of the time we don't require a student, you know, to follow through any of those resources. But the university does have a process where if there is documented behavior, where there is a risk of harm to self or others, then we do require the student to receive an evaluation from a mental health provider. And you know, we don't require <coughs> more treatment, but that initial evaluation to assess safety concerns and then to get some recommendations from there, that is something that we can and do require the student to do. And so if we can have that documented in some way, you know, the, any type of threatening language you know, towards self or towards others, that, that's very helpful for us to assist. Good question. Thank you so much. So this is the first year we've done this situation. I want to thank you so much. It was really valuable. It was really good information that the students can use, right, and you know where to go. We're going to move on to our next presentation, so let's, uh, let's